Hey there, my friends. This is Dr. Anthony Balduzzi, and I want to welcome you back to another episode here on the Fit Father Project and the Fit Mother Project podcast. Today, we're joined by Dr. Mark Milstein, PhD, who specializes in taking the leading science on brain research and brain health and really just making it easily digestible for all of us to understand so that we can not only live long and healthy lives with you know, our physical body, our body fat, but really have a sharp mind, great mood, and Personally, this is a super important topic that I'm passionate about because when we look around in the world right now, it's so clear that there's a big trend for all of us with aging parents and even with ourselves, we're noticing that there's changes of cognition, uh, dementia and Alzheimer's are rising and he's the author of this new book to help people fix that called The Age-Proof Brain, New Strategies to Improve Memory, Protect Immunity and Fight Off Dementia. So I highly recommend you check out the book as well because we're only going to be scratching the surface on these practical tips that Dr. Milstein is uh, a leading expert in. And I think what's cool about this is when we talk about brain function, as we're going to see in this conversation, we're talking about the entire body. Body. It's not like the brain is just like an isolated thing. It's like the control mechanism that is interfacing with the nervous system. And that means when we talk about brain health, we're necessarily talking about our sleep, environmental toxins, our nutrition, our exercise, or lack thereof. So Dr. Milstein, welcome to the podcast, my friend. Thank you. Thanks for having me here. Happy to be here. Okay. So I want to kind of set the stage for this conversation with some of the statistics. You know, I, I brought up a couple of these things in prep for this, and I'm going to read them. And I'd like you to speak into, is this actually what's going on? So I think this was from alzheimers.org. It said that there's over 55 million people worldwide living with dementia, and that was in 2020. And this number will almost double every 20 years, reaching 78 million in 2030 and 139 million in 2050. And the increase will, in, will happen mostly in developing countries, but we're certainly having it here in the USA. In the USA specifically, it says that one in three seniors dies with Alzheimer's or dementia. And then it kills more people than breast cancer and prostate cancer. And that the cost of this in 2023 is going to be in $345 billion. And by 2050, it could be a trillion dollars. Is this like what's actually going on? And if the, that's the case, why the heck are we not talking about this in a bigger way? Yeah, I, I mean, I think you're hitting the nail on the head. That's why we, we need to talk about this. We need to talk about it now because on the with all those sobering and scary statistics, the hopeful side of it is that in the last couple of years, we now know that we can lower risk of Alzheimer's mm -hmm. and dementia anywhere from 30 to 60%. It's not all nice. things. Uh, things that we can do, I, t I like to say little things can have a big impact, little lifestyle changes mm -hmm. um, that we can kind of stack together can have a powerful impact. So the other aspect of this is that the changes in our brain that impact our, our brain health or our memory start in our 40s mm. and even in our 30s and so we want to talk about these things now yeah um, because we can impact our brain health decades from now by doing these things now nice and I, I think to set the stage, I think it'd be nice to even define the difference between Alzheimer's and dementia because I think people throw those things out synonymously and obviously they're related but can you clear that up for us? Yeah, definitely and so it's they're understandably confused because they were used interchangeably for so many years. But now it is important that we define them and, and separate them because dementia is just symptoms of memory loss to the point where it's interfering with the ability to get through the day. Mm -hmm. So it could be changes to one's personality, trouble making a decision, or just significant memory loss. Again, so that it's interfering with the ability to get through the day. Mm -hmm. Many, many causes of dementia, but one of the most important causes of dementia that we need to talk about because it's the the most common specific disease that causes dementia is alzheimer's mm -hmm. so there again many things can cause dementia it can be a hormone imbalance a vitamin deficiency a, a, an injury issues with the heart but alzheimer's is one specific disease that causes the symptoms of dementia and so that's why we, we need to talk about it nice and great definition and i think maybe people who are listening to this now we can do our part in this conversation by just like using more specific language and we're, people are going to be way more informed by the end of this conversation, which is great. And I, I got to ask you before we get into some of the things we can do to keep our brain health like great, why do you think we're seeing such a massive increase in it now? Is it just we're diagnosing it more or is there something happening in our environment that's affecting us in a major way that's leading to these big spikes in these diagnoses? It's, it's multiple factors. It's everything from we're living longer physically living longer. So when we, what we want to do is we want to make it so that the years that we're living longer are not just that we're physically there, but we're also mentally there. Um, so that's the brain should outlast the body if we take care of it. So that's really hopeful news. Um, and also the things that you mentioned are important too. We realize that pollution, environmental toxins, they play a role too. 
and also underlying conditions. You really hit the nail on the head again in the in the intro when you said it's not just it's not just what's happening in your brain. It's not just doing a crossword puzzle or, or you know mm-hmm. you know doing a brain game. It, it's about your heart health. It's about your gut health. It's about diabetes risk. It's it's all these factors. Mm-hmm. And so, for example, we know diabetes is one of our single greatest risk factors for Alzheimer's if it's not treated. Yeah. But if we treat the diabetes, that risk comes back down. So we've identified these factors that are going up in the population and thus playing a role in some cases driving things like Alzheimer's disease um, and overall dementia. So that's where we have this the, these avenues to make a really make a difference is by you know attacking these these avenues and bringing risk down. Yeah, and I, I think it's fascinating what you just said is how related our cardio metabolic health really is. And I think many of us just think of it as, oh, I don't want to be on a particular prescription medication or I don't want to have this level of body fat. But like the brain being our most metabolically active and important organ that we do possess is living in the the neurochemical soup and the blood flow and everything that we're experiencing. So inherently it affects the brain. So that's like so obvious. And I tell us about some of the new research on what we know does accelerate aging of the brain and what's surprising about that. Well, I would, th- there's several things, but one thing that I think is just so powerful because we can take control of it is our sleep. Mm-hmm. But we now know that, you know, when, when you're sleeping at night, you're not just resting, <laughs> you're also taking care of your brain and you're, you're literally squeezing out trash toxins and waste that just build up throughout the day. Mm-hmm. And I always like to tell people, you know, your brain's just three pounds, but every year it makes five pounds of all different types of waste, garbage, trash. So like leftover chemical reactions, broken down proteins. It's just, you know, it's like a little factory. It's making stuff and it also makes byproducts. Mm -hmm. And as we get older, our ability to remove this waste can become less efficient or effective. Mm -hmm. And you can think about your brain like a house or an apartment. If it fills up with too much waste or garbage, it's hard to find things. It's hard to be productive. Same thing with the brain. So sleep is just an opportunity for us to remove this waste from the brain. And we're just seeing study after study, even studies that came out this week, that are really showing us that if we can really get effective sleep, really good deep sleep, mm-hmm. we can help this process of, of waste removal. And so, you know, think about sleep as not just a time to rest, but a time to really take care of your brain. Keep it, I like to say, keep it clean. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and so th- those are the things we want to think about and talk about. Well, I think it's really important for people to understand and like a little physiology, maybe we can get into, and, and yes. this is of my limited understanding of it. There's like, we have a lymphatic system, yes. which is carrying our immune system and different fluids throughout the body. But the brain has its own like unique lymphatic system that the immune system and all this cleanup happening. It's called like the glial cells. Like people call it the lymphatic system. Yeah. Can we speak into that a little bit. Yeah, exactly. So it's really interesting because we, this is new insights uh-huh. for, for years, people thought that the lymphatic system ended at the neck. And that we just didn't know how waste was removed in the brain. And then there was this major breakthrough that we now know that the, the, this, this, the glial cells, they basically, they, cut, they squeeze. They, that's basically what they do is they squeeze out waste, trash, and toxins. So when you go to bed at night, it sounds bizarre, but the system is actually squeezing your brain and, and it's like constricting. I know it sounds bizarre, mm-hmm. but it's squeezing into essentially like this empty space that forms yeah. in your brain. And then cerebral spinal fluid comes up from your spinal cord and washes this trash away. And then the next big question was, well, where does this all go? And then there was another big discovery just recently that there's these like vesicles, think of them tunnels in your neck. And that's where the waste exits out. And then your lymphatic system, because now you're yeah. getting things into your body, takes over and gets rid of this, this waste. So, you know, we thought we had it all mapped out, but we, there, these things are so tiny and so, so hard to, to visualize, but the technology is now caught up to the point where we're like, this is amazing and really, really accentuates the point of why we need to prioritize things like sleep. Nice. And and while we're still chatting about sleep, because I know we're going to get into a lot of different factors, nutrition, yeah. exercise, brain training, et cetera. Like, yeah. what do you personally do to optimize your sleep or what kind of habits, hacks, trips do you think are really important for people to know? Yeah, I think that what I, so the reason I'm, I even got interested in all of this is because I personally am not a good sleeper uh, unless I do these things that we're going to talk about. And it's, we've have these amazing insights into how the brain works, which is a, a, a showing us how to sleep better. And our brain is so tuned to light and dark, and it sounds so simple and almost ridiculous, but in our modern world, we can easily lose sight of how this has changed. So for example, we now know that in the morning, if you get outside in the presence of natural sunlight, you know, soon after getting up for even just 10 or 15 minutes, 
you start a countdown process in your brain. It's called your um, your suprachiasmatic nucleus or your brain clock, mm -hmm. and it's like a timer that counts down when it when it gets in the presence of light. Mm -hmm. That counts down to when you're going to sleep that night. And so, it sounds ridiculous, but we can easily be working from home or jump in a car or on a bus or a train, and we go to work or we're staying at home and we don't get outside. Yeah. And so just simply a little bit more morning light mm -hmm. can help that countdown process that helps you fall asleep at night. And then on the other side of this is just looking around your bedroom and asking yourself, am I, am I sleeping in the dark or have I really grown accustomed over the last couple of years of sleeping in an illuminated bedroom? That it, mm -hmm. it seems insignificant, but studies have come out even this year that have found that those little bits of light throughout our room, you know, your, your, your phone charging in the corner or the, the light on the TV, they can throw off the brain's ability to get into the deepest stages of sleep, mm -hmm. interfering possibly with that brainwash, but even more specifically to things that I know that you really care about and, and think about and talk about a lot is mm -hmm. your heart rate, your blood pressure, your insulin response. Yeah. We, we now see in studies that if these lights are in our rooms, they throw off these processes. So we realize that it's important to just assess your bedroom and just unplug a few things, experiment with making your room a little darker. So I really, those are things I focus on is really, even when I'm traveling, when I'm at home is like, okay, I need that morning light and I need to just really assess the room I'm sleeping in and just make it darker. Sometimes I use a sleep mask yeah. just to really give my brain true darkness and I feel much more energized and focused the next day. Nice. I mean, it's all about light. It's a message that we're seeing like all over the place right now. And you know, the, the eyes are literally an extension of the brain. Like, I yeah. mean, you could say it that way. So it's like, makes sense that it's that important. And then like melatonin, I think that's like kind of like a, a misunderstood thing. Like, I don't think people understand how important it is for the brain. Can we speak into that a little bit? Cause people think, oh, it's a sleep supplement or yeah. it's circadian rhythm. But like, what are the real impacts of like melatonin and some of the health effects it has on the brain itself? Yeah. So the way melatonin works in the brain is we go back to that brain clock, that suprachiasmatic nucleus. And um, what we realize is that think about when you're lying in bed at night and you're in the dark, that that brain clock notices you're in the dark mm -hmm. and it sends a signal to release melatonin. Mm -hmm. So if you're in the dark, you, you get this process going. But if your room is too bright or if you're you know looking at the screens before bed, that blue light from those devices, if, especially if people are very sensitive to it, mm -hmm. that tells the brain clock that it's daytime because those wavelengths of light are very similar to, to sunlight. Yep. And it tricks the brain clock into suppressing the release of melatonin. Mm -hmm. And so that melatonin is, is very important for sleep induction, helping falling asleep, helping staying asleep. Mm -hmm. So we really want to optimize the light and dark in our room. Um, and I'm going to say optimize the darkness in our room and the lightness in the morning because the light in the morning also plays a role in regulating the, the circadian rhythm of taking a break from that yeah. melatonin release so it can be optimized later at night. So really we want to turn to first, you know, people say, oh, just, you know, grab a supplement. We're concerned about the quality of supplements. We're concerned about their interfering with other medications, long-term use of them, high doses. So they can be used under the care of a physician in some cases, but we, we've learned so much about how the brain works that we're, we're saying, let's use the things we know work that are safe and effective in terms of light and dark first. Um, because they can be really powerful and helpful. Nice. Really well said. Now, the brain, in my understanding, is like this central processing unit that then has all these uh, nerves that exit the spinal cord and, 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 and all the cranial nerves and, and it interfaces with every organ in some way, shape, or form. So like, what happens when the brain is not doing great? Let's say we're not sleeping well, we have stressful lives, light is jacked up, blood sugar is probably high. Like, How does that affect the rest of the body when the brain is not in optimal health as we're getting older? Yeah, absolutely. So one way to think about it is just the vagus nerve. That's a, a big connector. Um, it runs from the brain basically to your gut. Mm -hmm. And so that's really just allows us to start talking about gut brain health, which is obviously very topical, but really fascinating. And also, if we just think about it this way, I, I like to think of the vagus nerve like a guitar string. And it, you can basically pluck it in a way that's soothing, or you can like hit it constantly. And if you yeah. think about your brain or the electrical activity is, is frazzled mm -hmm. and you know, you're not sleeping well, or you're high, like, experiencing high levels of detrimental stress. What can happen is, is that you're sending electrical impulses in a, in a kind of a chaotic or a highly stimulated fashion mm -hmm. down to your heart that the, the vagus nerve runs down yeah. through, through the abdomen, through your gut. And then we realize that what's happening in our brain impacts how we're feeling from the neck down, but also it's a two-way street. So we realize that it's it's not only a loop, information going back and forth, but if your gut or your heart is not in optimal 
uh, healthy states that it's sending signals back up that vagus nerve yeah. that can cause more stress, anxiety, um, impact your ability to think, remember cognition. So we realized that, it, it, you know, at its essence, it's a two-way street and it, it starts in the brain, but also it's getting feedback from the body back and forth. Right. And, and then there's the whole aspect of just like how the brain itself and the different regions of the brain, those connected circuits are also helping us respond to stimuli like emotionally, like whether it's our reward systems or memory systems. Um, and, and I guess that's where the, there's this major interplay, not just on like a physiologic basis, but also on a psychological basis too, right? I mean, we're all looking at our phones these days, attention spans are certainly going down. So like, how is just modern living? And I'll define modern living as like in the United States is like busy, like constantly looking at things, probably decently stressful and very technologically based. Like this hasn't really happened before in this, to this extent. And, you know, we're all connected with this stuff. How's that affecting our brain health? Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. So there's good and bad in technology. It can bring us closer together. It can bring us, uh, you know, new information. It can make us more productive, but with every good, there's things we have to balance with, which are, we're concerned about. And so some of the things that we're concerned about is that, you know, neuroscientists have been hired to basically make our devices tap into aspects of how our brain works so that we don't want to put them down. Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned, the, re the reward system, we love, our brain loves new information. Mm -hmm. doesn't matter what it is. We want it at random times <laughs> and we want to be, and we, it's like, that's why slot machines are so yeah. powerful because you don't know when you're going to get that hit. It's unpredictable. If it was predictable, it actually wouldn't be as interesting to the brain. Yeah. And so your phone or our phones are set up in a way, you know, the same way they're beeping and buzzing at unpredictable times with texts and, and notifications. And our brain is constantly wanting to know what's next. You know, think about your brain, you know, 10,000 years ago, it was always searching for new information, food. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's locked into this. And what can happen is, is that if that constant state of stimulation can just be wearing and exhausting to the brain yeah. and just thinking about boundaries of breaks, you know, taking time to say, I just need to, I don't want to be in that feedback loop because I'm constantly sending electrical stimulation from that, from my brain down to my heart and my gut. Yeah. And it's not really designed to do that. Stress is good in a moment in a burst, yeah. but all day long, constantly, we're just wearing out our body. Um, and we're, we're activating systems that are meant for moments, not for all day long. Right. And I, I mean, it makes me think as you're sharing that, that you and I are pretty fortunate because we grew up in a time where we didn't have this preponderance of technology like we were probably outside doing stuff and like right. but yet now we have it at our fingertips with the kind of brains that we have developed in a healthier environment to then use it as tools but like the kids today yeah man it's like a pretty interesting time to be alive like to have these phones the electromagnetic fields let alone all the addiction stuff so like let's speak a little bit into what you're seeing on some of the research or just your general take and feeling about kids today and the vulnerabilities for parents here listening to this, like their kids are certainly addicted to a phone way, some way, shape or form. Like yes. speaking to that, please. Yeah, definitely. So I, I'm the father of uh, two girls and, and you know, you see it and, and, and you, I, we, something we talk about in our house quite a bit that the way things used to be the good old days um, versus the way things are now. And I like to frame it that there's pros and cons now. I, I don't want to be the, the father that's like, in my day, it was all good. You know, there's, there's benefits and, and, and drawbacks to every era. Um, but the things that we are concerned about and, and we want to think about and talk about and prioritize is that those devices can keep us from doing a couple things. One is getting to sleep at night mm -hmm. and realizing that the light that comes from those devices, not only for adults, but kids are more susceptible. Their eyes are in a developmental phase and they're more susceptible to that blue light. And we think about kids being on screens before bed and how we talk about sleep being important as we age. Yeah. Well, our brain is developing the first 25 years of our life. And what's happening in those years is critical. So really setting some boundaries and saying, you know, let's put the phone away the hour before bed. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to old fashioned books. Let's go back to, you know, just taking a break from them can be really helpful. Listening to music, but not through a phone <laughs> if possible. Yeah. And then thinking about nature, getting outside, that we have all this evidence now that being outside in the presence of nature just for like 10 minutes brings yeah. your stress levels down. And if we're on our phones too much, we're missing out on really that connection that's important for our brain and for kids too is just getting outside and playing it's not just like something nice to say there's really strong scientific evidence about how important this is at any age mm -hmm. and then also just face-to-face -face connection i mean you know we can do it through screens now mm -hmm. and that can be good and that can be helpful 
but there are times that we want to put put the screens down and just look into each other's eyes and have yeah. that empathetic connection in that conversation because it's really irreplaceable. You know, technology can bring us close together, allow us to have conversations with people all over the world, but there's when we're looking at, e at each other, especially parents and children, you know, we build trust, we build yeah. empathy, and it's not something that we can do, you know, while we're looking at our phone and texting. You know, you have that feeling like we know that when someone's texting and, and talking to us, we're like angry <laughs> and it's because it's mm -hmm. it's it's disrupting this mirror system in the brain where we want people looking at us we want them to oh you get me because you're looking and you're you're, you're with me you're whatever if i'm smiling you're smiling if i'm sad you're kind of mimicking my face and we can't get that you know when we're distracted by the devices yeah really well said i want to dive a little more into the brain gut connection you mentioned yeah. the vagus nerve which is a huge part of the story but also I'd like you to maybe speak into like the impacts of certain kinds of like foods that we're eating. If there's a relationship between food products or maybe like how foods have changed, like are, are like pesticides, inflammatory foods related? Like what's the, what's the, what's the conversation here, both in terms of like what we eat that's good for brain health, what we eat that's not good for brain health. Um, and then uh, maybe even neurotransmitters in the gut. Like let's dive into this for a few minutes. Cause I think it's an important topic. Yeah. D yeah, for sure. So let me just say like a few seconds of science mm -hmm. before the tips, because I think it really helps the tips make more sense. Yeah. And it's that we talked about cleaning your brain when you're asleep, washing out the toxins and waste. Well, there's a few other things you do to keep your brain clean, which is basically like keeping it youthful and keeping it protected. We just want to get rid of this waste and garbage. So the other way that we do this is that you have these amazing cells called microglia mm -hmm. and they're like, Imagine like in an aquarium, you know, those bottom feeders that are gobbling up the garbage and the waste. Well, they're in your brain. They're part of your immune system and they're eating up trash, toxins and waste for you, keeping your brain clean. And it's great. But the problem is, is that these microglia get confused and they make a mistake. And instead of eating up trash and waste and garbage and leftover junk, they start eating and attacking healthy brain cells. Hmm. And that does damage to memory, cognition, raises the risk of depression, anxiety. So at its essence, what we're saying is, well, why, why did the microglia make a mistake? Why do they get confused? Why, why can't they just focus and, and, and eat the trash? Well, they're receiving signals and the signals come from the neck down and it comes from inflammation and inflammation. One of the biggest starting points of inflammation is in our gut. Mm -hmm. And what can happen is, is that inflammation leaves the gut. It gets into the bloodstream. It makes its way to the brain mm -hmm. and it confuses those microglia into going into attack mode. So then we take one step back and we say, well, what's causing the inflammation in the gut? And a big part of it is the things that we're eating. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, diet is complex and it can be individualized, but if we look at all the data, we can really get some simple take home messages, which is whole natural foods. Most of the time, mm -hmm. you know, think about nuts, beans, fiber, vegetables, fruits, just like most of the time, whole natural foods. There's evidence that, you know, people who follow these types of diets, like the mind diet, Mediterranean like diets, they lower the risk of Alzheimer's by about 35% if they sort of follow that diet. If they strictly follow it, they lower the risk by about 53%. Mm -hmm. And it's because these foods are anti-inflammatory. Mm -hmm. They're they're helping send less inflammatory signals to the brain to confuse the microglia so that they can microglia can just do their job. And then the things we want to minimize and avoid, I just always, you know, like to tell a quick story that I was in a museum in Chicago and, and they have a Twinkie that they unwrapped like 15 years ago and it's sitting there and it looks great. <laughs> That's what we're worried about. The foods that it's yeah. just additives, preservatives, ultra processed foods. You know, if you look at your packaging and it's like, I can't pronounce this stuff. This is like a chemistry experiment gone wrong. We just want to minimize those things because those cause inflammation in the gut that mm -hmm. spreads through the bloodstream, confuses the microglia into attacking healthy parts of the brain. So that's where like really simple diet advice is tied to some really amazing science that's complex, but at the same time is like, oh, I now I see why yeah. these foods make a big difference. Yeah. And I think what you just shared gives people yet another reason to guide towards healthier foods. It's not just about body composition, right? I mean, yeah. there's a lot of weight to what you just said, because I mean, our subjective life experience, how happy we are, how clear we are, how energized we are, how connected we feel is largely determined by the health of our brain. Yeah. You know, like you said, the depression could be caused by this auto inflammation or autoimmune process in the brain with the glial yeah. cells. So it's like, man, just more reasons to not eat BS. Right. Like, and that's okay. Like once in a while, but like, especially for our kids too, it's like, Wow. Powerful. Yeah. I, I'm really glad you did share that. Oh, no, thanks. Yeah. It's really, it really, it, I think it resonates, you know, and it's, it, 
you, we realize that this is all connected and, but again, simple things that we can do just really like, I always like to say to people, like when you're in the grocery store, you know, usually there's an item next to each other. Like if you're looking at peanut butter, one of them is natural and the other one is filled with all this junk <laughs> and, and just pick the one that's natural. And just those little choices can go a long way. Yeah. Cause you can still have these same things where you're just getting like the best in slot version of X, Y, Z best exactly. in slot, even healthy chip. Like it's not saying you can't have any unhealthy quote unquote food, but there's that's benefit technologies. We have a lot of options today, which is great. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about, um, movement and exercise, which many people think of as like a, a metabolism and fat burning and muscle building activity, but it's clearly linked to brain health. Like, can you get into some of the research on that? Yeah, definitely. So this is another area where we have a lot of powerful insights with really simple solutions. So they actually, they've one of the largest studies ever done on how do you lower risk for dementia followed like several thousand people for 30 years. And they found if people just walked for 30 minutes a day, didn't have to all be done at the same time, they lowered their risk of dementia by about 60%. Wow. And so what we realize is that, you know, people say, do I really have to walk? You know, walking we now know is really important when we walk. We actually send a, a pressure wave signal from our feet up through our legs and it synchronizes our heart brain connection. Mm -hmm. And that's critically important. Like a, a lot of the dementia that we see is, is, is really rooted in, you know, heart dysfunction or cardiovascular issues. So it's, it, that's one of the ways that we optimize that system. And then the other thing that we see is important is, is how fast we walk. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't have to power walk everywhere you go, but we, we call it gate speed. Mm -hmm. And we have all these interesting studies that show that people who can walk fast, you know, even for just like, if you think of your 30 minutes of walking a day, yeah. six to 10 minutes of the walking, walk a little faster, like mm -hmm. walk with a little speed and intent. It, we've seen studies that show that people have a better memory that day mm -hmm. and they have a better memory years down the road. So there's something about keeping the brain youthful. And I, I should mention that, you know, starting at the age of 40, our brain starts to age. It starts to shrink about 5% every 10 years, mm -hmm. but that doesn't have to happen because we start putting together all these little things we're talking about, optimize our sleep, think about what we're eating, get a little bit more walking in. And we see in studies that people's brain doesn't shrink as much. They, mm -hmm. it, they keep their brain more youthful. It's like their brain is younger than their actual age. Mm -hmm. So that's where, you know, exercise beyond that, I want to be very clear, it can be really good. You know, mm -hmm. there's something to be said for, for, you know, in increasing intensity and hit workouts and all those things and weightlifting and, and balancing, but keeping it to something that's really attainable and easily for, for most everybody. And we realize that there's a lot of protection and the threshold is not as high as we thought yeah. as a, to say, you can get a lot of brain health protection with just these simple things. Right. And I feel like this all kind of stacks upon itself, like getting outside, yeah. getting your nature, getting your sunshine, taking a yeah. walk. It's like, it's affecting all of these systems so beneficially. And it, like, I, I know I've seen some of the research on the longevity, you know, let's talk about the blue zones kind of concept. People who are centenarians and live a long time, like they have a lot of daily activity. They're eating mostly natural diets and, and they have a lot of good social connections and sense of purpose. So I guess I want to hit on the last bit of it. Like how much of it is having a sense of purpose and connection that impacts our, our brain health as well? Is there an, a psychological aspect of it? Yeah, there is, there is a, it's a big piece. And, you know, we tend to think, oh, you know, is there real data for the mind body connection? There's a study I was just looking at a few days ago that there's some real powerful impacts on, on our state of mind for our overall health. And it's related to the immune system. That's a big part of it mm -hmm. is that when we're in a state, uh, again, stress can be okay. It can be very good in a moment, in a burst, mm -hmm. but if it's, but our mindset can impact our stress response mm -hmm. and taking a break from stress is really important. And things that allow us to, to, to take a break from stress or having a sense of purpose, they can having a, a, a social connection, things like that. So yeah. just, you know, just throw out a really interesting stat is people who have a positive attitude towards the aging process have about a 50% lower chance of developing dementia. <laughs> and when, what we mean by that is that people who do things that are, you know, active, they, they, they feel good about, you know, socializing, traveling, eating the way we're talking about, just doing all these things that are like, you know, I'm going to embrace this. I'm going to, I'm going to just be the best version of myself um, and not being afraid. And understandably there's, there's, this is a, it can be a very hard thing to talk about, but we need to talk about it. Yeah. But we realize mindset, it's not everything. And none of these things are everything. That's the real, mm -hmm. that's another yeah. big message. It's, it's, it's straws on a camel's back. Mm -hmm. And how do we take as many straws off to kind of push odds in our favor? Yeah. Really well said. And I guess like what you're describing is truly like a holistic 
like healthy life. Like there's no yeah. two ways about it. I just, I'm sure you'll agree with this statement. You can't just take any like marketed brain supplement thing that has whatever form of magnesium or blueberry extract right. in it. And like your brain's going to be good and healthy. Like it's a holistic approach. That being said, is there stuff that people can take when they have the foundations down? They are living in accordance to what you described. Are there particular foods or supplements um, that you think are good for promoting brain health? You know, it's interesting because a study came out, and I keep saying this week, <laughs> but the data the data keeps coming, and that's good. That's really good. But we, we saw a study this week that showed they looked at people age 60 and up, mm -hmm. and they found if they took just a simple multivitamin, mm -hmm. their their brain performed like three years younger. Nice. And and it's interesting. It's And what they said is diet is the most important, without a doubt. Mm -hmm. And, and we, we know that we can't just take a pill. Just like you said, there, there's no magic pill. There's no magic supplement. It, diet is, that's the first thing, because we know the absorption's better with food, yeah. and it's the combinations of food. It's, mm -hmm. you know, some people say, I'm just going to eat, you know, you, you meet somebody at the health food store, like, today is just blueberries. Well, we don't, <laughs> it's really what we see, it's the interaction between what's in the foods, synergistically working together. So, right. you know, looking at your plate and just saying, like, I see colorful fruits and vegetables, uh, you know, I've got some good fiber, nuts, beans, whole grain, whatever that is for that works for that person. Fish is very good for the brain with the omega threes are really helpful. Yeah. But what's interesting about the multivitamin is that, you know, even with a healthy diet, there's probably can be some gaps. So, you know, talking to your doctor, you know, what, checking some blood levels, if anything's deficient, of course, you know, food, w what are the foods that are, that are good there? If food isn't addressing it, which can happen, a supplement can be used responsibly, mm -hmm. but just this new insight of just a general, you know, inexpensive multivitamin, um, something to think about and talk about with your doctor and see that we know we have some, some good evidence now that that can be something that is, you know, it's not, it's not complex. It's not, it's not expensive. It's something that's, it's, it's, we have some evidence to say this is, is, is a worthwhile thing for people to talk to their doctor about. Nice. Now you mentioned a couple things, a couple times, one of those being light yeah. and like being having a good circadian rhythm and also the immune system so like my mind is immediately jumping to like vitamin d has to play a role in this picture like is there yeah. some research between vitamin d brain health depression like what can we speak on that connection yeah absolutely so we have we still have a lot of a lot of powerful data on vitamin d um so what we realize is that there are parts of the the world and certain um uh, groups of people that have that struggle with getting optimal levels of vitamin D. So being aware of, of your levels is important. And then thinking about the foods that are that, that have vitamin D in them is important. Sometimes that's not enough for, for people based on absorption issues or again, those environmental factors. The interesting thing about vitamin D though, is that we want to be really careful with the, the, the blogs and the blurbs and the headlines because with vitamin D, what we saw in the last couple of years was it was the, you know, it was the the supplement of choice. Everyone should be taking vitamin D. Mm. And if you need it, that can be good. That can be helpful and necessary. But we actually see if the vitamin D levels are too high, mm -hmm. that can actually cause issues with, with memory and cognition. Mm. So it really comes back to balance of yeah. saying like, if things are, you know, that's why the relationship with, with, the, with your doctor is important to just, you know, once or twice a year, yeah. check those levels. If they're low, a supplement is definitely can be used if, if food isn't doing it. But then checking again to make sure the levels aren't too high, you know, with some of these mega doses that, that can be used. Um, or high, higher doses, because if the levels get too high, that can actually have a negative function. And that's where we see with, you know, the supplements, we just want to be careful, use them responsibly if we need them, but be careful that it's, it's not just about more and more. Mm -hmm. um, it can have a negative impact on brain health too. And it does seem like something that'd be really easy for people to incorporate into regular lab work that they do along with yeah. your cholesterol and lipid panels, like get a D check and it's a seasonal yeah. moving target. As you mentioned before, time of the year, yeah. skin tone, et cetera. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about memory. I think one of the main ways that people notice as they get older is like, they're trying to have this recall aspect and they're like, ah, I just don't remember stuff like I used to. And that can be a scary sign that there's some degree of cognitive decline. So what can people do to improve their memory outside of everything we've mentioned? Obviously yeah. it will help because memory is a, a main function of certain areas of the brain. Um, is there specific advice you have on sharpening memory? Yeah. So all the things we talked about are important. I like to think of it like your brain's like a car. Like mm -hmm. you have to have the health of your your car and the health of your brain. If it, if things aren't working, it's just not going to work. But mm -hmm. then how do you drive the car? How do you use the, the car? How do you learn how to use it to its optimal levels? And a couple tricks um, to talk about. One is just practice. You know, we live in a world where 
everything we've ever wanted to remember is in our phones and memory is very much use it or lose it. Mm -hmm. And if you think about like just phone numbers, you know, I, I remember the days where I, I knew a lot of phone numbers and now I, it's very hard to memorize a new phone number because yeah. your brain knows once information is stored somewhere safely, it is going to do everything it can not to waste precious resources and memorizing it, mm -hmm. but we want to practice memorizing. So it doesn't have to be phone numbers, but just taking some time during the week and saying like, maybe I'm going to turn my to-do list over and practice memorizing that or my grocery list. Or, you know, if you like follow sports, I'm going to try to memorize the lineup of the players or, or actors and actresses in a movie. Mm -hmm. It's use it or lose it. And we can easily be not practicing that anymore, especially in these times. So just taking some time to practice memory is really important. Also cross training your brain is, is really good. So thinking about the type of information that you're learning, learning new things is one of the most powerful things you can do for your brain because you're making new connections. And so it's, it's good to practice things you already know, but there's nothing like something that's new and outside of your field of expertise. Yeah. So a couple of times a week, you know, if it's, if it's a new, if it's a podcast, if it's a book, if it's a course online, it doesn't seem to matter what it is, but that it's new and it's different. And then another day or two of the week, something that is physically challenging, yeah. dancing, yoga, a new pickleball, doesn't matter what it is, but we see evidence that that can help your memory too, is that you have to remember how to make these movements and that can carry over to just remembering things. And then the third thing is be social, like spend a day or two, just like meeting your friend for coffee and talking mm -hmm. about the book you're reading or the podcast that you're listening to or the class you're taking. That's really helpful for our memory. It's one thing to take the information in, yeah. but when we talk about it, we activate other parts of the brain involved in memory. So think about that cross training. You know, if you went to the gym, you wouldn't just do curls all day. You would, right. you'd want to do different parts of the body. Same thing with the brain. And then one last tip, not to just overload, but yeah. just being aware that multitasking, a lot of the times we're like, what did I want in the refrigerator? What was that person's name? Where did I put my keys? You know, we're not spending more than two seconds and we're just on to the next or we're just doing too many things at once. Something that's remarkably simple is when you want to remember something, just do one thing in that moment and spend an extra few seconds. Sounds silly, but there's a part of your brain called the hippocampus and it's always filtering things out. And the way to get past that so that you actually remember things is it likes one thing at a time and it likes about seven seconds of focusing on it. Your brain goes, oh, this is important. I'm not going to throw it away and filter it out. I'm going to actually send it on to long-term memory. So, you know, you want to remember something, say, I, I have to focus on this and nothing but this for an extra few seconds. People are surprised how much more, more they remember, especially in a world where we're just like, you know, constantly onto the next, onto the next. Man, powerful, truly powerful tips there. And I, a couple things came up for me as you were sharing that on the last bit, it's, I am making a concerted effort to remember people's names more when I meet them. And I think it's like those first four or five seconds when you come to say hi to somebody. Yeah. And then there's a lot of things that may be going on in your mind. And they could be even like self things like, oh my, like, do I know them? What do I look like? Where is this? And like, right. then they say their name and then it's gone. Yeah. And, and so it's, it's like maybe just even being more intentional about these types of acts and practices. So it's like, wait, your name's Mark, right? Yeah. Mark, M-A-R-C. Like right. there's our seven seconds. Now it's, it's going to be a lot better. And honestly, that's connection too. the yeah. next thing that you shared that I thought was super cool is I think we do live in a world of like passive consumption where podcasts like this, you could just listen to them as you're doing stuff and you probably are right now. And that's awesome. But I guess that extra step of then taking it and then sharing it yeah. is like profoundly different. I was yeah. listening to a YouTube video from somebody who was like a, a college test whiz that like gets a hundred percent on the test that like people barely pass. And that was like the main tip that this individual shared is that they do this, like they learn, but then they do the, like the active recall sharing kind of aspect to it. And it yeah. makes all of the difference really cool. And, and one other habit, old school habit practice that I've heard that is cool. So maybe, maybe people can play around with it is at the end of your day, before you're about to go to sleep, you can do like a, a playback in reverse order of like what you did that day. And yeah. I mean, you don't have to do this, but imagine, okay, so I'm in bed before this, I was brushing my teeth before this, I was, you know, with my family eating dinner and then I was doing X, Y, Z and like, it's just a little mind game, you know, but if, but imagine the benefit you get, if you had something like that on a regular basis, like it'd probably be pretty powerful. Yeah, and that you're actually tapping into something that we know um, is really important. When you're sleeping, your brain, during REM sleep, your brain takes every new thing you learn that day or new experience 
and it makes the connection. So when you learn something, you make a connection between your, a synaptic connection between your brain cells. Mm -hmm. But when you're in REM sleep, you make the connection stronger. Mm -hmm. And there's this evidence that if you review information, and we've experienced this, you know, when we took tests at school, it's like, oh, I, I reviewed it right before bed, and I feel like I know it better in the morning. Yeah. And that's because when you sleep at night, your brain finds those things that you that you um, that you just learned, and it runs electrical stimulation over them. That's kind of when you're dreaming, yeah. and it makes the connection stronger. So you can kind of help that process along by right before bed, just reviewing some information and making those memories stick. Yeah, that's really cool advice. And I actually personally do try to do that. Like if I know I have, I'm interviewing an expert like you the following day, I'll try to do a quick little review before. Cause even if it's like one or two minutes, I know I'm taking yeah. advantage of this natural process. So yeah. I'm glad you, I'm glad you mentioned that. Now, do you, can we speak into some things that disrupt REM sleep? So I know like things that come to the top of my mind is alcohol, yeah. cannabis, you know, things like this, like things that people may think are benign, but if they're impacting REM sleep, that's something yeah. like what are the, what, what should people know about like disruptors of REM sleep? Yeah. So it's okay to wake up. That's a big thing. It, people, it's okay to wake up. You actually wake up multiple times throughout the night, even if you're not aware of it, mm -hmm. but we don't want to disrupt just as you're saying, we don't want to wake up mid cycle mm -hmm. and REM sleep is happens within our cycles of sleep. So we want to finish the REM sleep and not have it be disturbed. So things that can affect it are noise. Mm -hmm. So that's why if you're if you're being disturbed by noise, being aware of, you know, like a sound machine with some waves or rain or even earplugs or just mm -hmm. trying to say, okay, what, what can I do to minimize noise that's going to jolt me awake in the middle of the night? Temperature is important too, mm -hmm. um, especially as summer's coming up now. Yeah. Cooler temperatures keep us into phases of the sleep cycle and, and keep us from waking up. So if you can, um, you know, make your room a little bit cooler, think about cooler pajamas or blankets. Yeah. Those things actually do have an impact on your quality of sleep. And then some, some interesting data I just was looking at recently, which is, is, is airflow in your room, mm -hmm. you know, thinking about, especially in the summertime, most people sleep with the door to their bedroom closed, mm -hmm. but thinking of it actually did a study where they found that if you just leave the door a little bit open, you know, we want to be safe, of course, depending on where you live, but the idea is that you just the bedroom door, if you leave it a little bit open and you have some air flowing in the room, people actually stayed in their sleep cycles more effectively. Hmm. And so just realizing that that those little things like temperature, light we already talked about is important too, sound and and air and airflow. Nice. Great, great tips. Now in the in the back part of this, we're getting close to wrapping up. I want to ask you a few questions about if you've seen any of the research or have any comments and thoughts on practices like prayer, contemplation, meditation on brain health, like, is there anything to share on that front? Yeah. Yeah. The, interesting. So mindfulness, we have a lot of evidence that that's beneficial for, for brain health it can help you sleep. You know, oftentimes we're doing one more thing before bed and one more task. And then we're like, just now I need to go to sleep. Well, the brain doesn't really work that way. It needs a transition. It needs a boundary. Um, and so mindfulness, prayer, um, it is a form of mindfulness. Mindfulness is just being in the present moment and having a positive attitude towards it. Mm -hmm. So that can be, you know, some people hear mindfulness and they're like, I'm all in. And some people are like, I don't like that word. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's, that's okay. It can be prayer. It can be just doing something you enjoy doing and being in the present moment and enjoying it. But what's happening in mindfulness is it's a quieting down of the brain. The day is so stimulating and there's just so much happening now in our modern world. Think about all the information that's hitting our brain that there's something to be said for just having a few moments in the morning before bed or just moments throughout the day where you're like, I'm just going to take a break. You know, mm -hmm. I like to think of it, even my computer now I'm looking at it. I've got a lot of windows open. I have that bad habit and I call it and they're like, they only ever, they only tell me like, just turn it off and turn it back on. Mm -hmm. Same thing with the brain. Like there just needs to be moments in the day where we just, we just singularly focus on something positive and prayer can be that if that's appropriate for the person we, there's actually brain science evidence that prayer is really good for the brain. If, if prayer isn't your, your, the thing that you're, you're interested in, then mindfulness is good too, or a combination of the two, but just finding moments of the day where like, I'm just going to take a break, be in the present moment and have a positive attitude towards it. And there's so many ways to do that with, you know, a breathing exercise, listening mm -hmm. to just music can be really good if you're just enjoying it, but just kind of singular tasks, relaxation, prayer has purpose. That's really important for brain health too. Um, so these are things that I always like to, you know, kind of highlight that we think about with health, like people can sometimes have the reaction of you're taking away stuff from me, but things you already enjoy doing can be really good for your brain. Yeah. And, and, and you can, and it's not all about taking away. It's just about doubling down on the things you already enjoy. Yeah. And one, one thing I heard you share there that seems very relevant is 
the importance of having these kind of anchors of mindfulness in the beginning and end of the day too, because yeah. these are these transition periods in the beginning. Yeah. We all know if we've had a day where alarm goes off, we're behind the bell, kids are doing crazy stuff in the morning, like whatever. It's like it, you get on a reactive kind of like pattern at the same time, if you are the other side, I should say, if you have a day that starts off with even a little space of like peacefulness, presence, centeredness, like your day is going to be better. And then you could also brush off a bad day or center upon and be grateful for a good day. So I, I hope people incorporate that into a morning routine, even if it's like one or two minutes, it doesn't have to be a full 30 minute to one hour, like deep session, but just a little bit, it's like habit stacking or just little bits of momentum. Yeah, exactly. And what you, the transition is so important. The way we wake up, part of it is we actually get a jolt of cortisol, mm -hmm. which helps us wake up. But you're, I like to think of it like your body's like a glass and mm -hmm. stress and cortisol is like water in the glass, which is all good. But if it's just filling up, then it overflows. That's burnout. That's, yeah. that's what we know is that physical manifestation of mental and physical burnout. And if we check our, you know, most, most of the time we, we, we feel tempted to check our phone first thing in the morning because we want that new information. Mm -hmm. um, but that's another cortisol hit really early yeah. on. So just taking a moment like, I'm just going to go for a one minute walk or I'm going to just take a few deep breaths or I'm just going to, you know, have my morning tea or coffee or whatever it is and just kind of bring that cortisol back down, get a little water out of the glass so that when I do check my phone, I'm not at the high level of, of just my physiological waking up that's normal and healthy for me. So it's just like, how throughout the day do I just take the moment to say, when do I need to pull back? And when do I need to just, you know, mm -hmm. get something done? Nice. I mean, what a great conversation. I think to wrap up all of these health and fitness principles we talk about inside of our fit father and fit mother communities, but in the context of brain health, like this has a lot of weight for me. And in the spirit of learning new things and practicing recall, I think everyone listening to this has the opportunity today to share what they learned from this conversation with someone in their immediate family because there's benefit and of course if you want to go on a learning journey your book the age-proof brain is something i highly recommend that's on amazon people can check out where else can people like learn more about your work and, and connect with you oh thank you um my website's a great place drmarkmilstein.com just the spelling of my name d-r-m-a-r-c-i-m-i-l-s-t-e-i-n i'm um, doing some more things on social media trying to share you know New studies with new tips. Just uh, here's, you know, a quick tip on sleep. So just at uh, my name, drmarkmilsign.com or do at, at drmarkmilsign. So that those are just two quick ways to, to, to keep up with some new tips. Nice. Well, thank you for your time, seriously. And this inspiring conversation I know is going to help a lot of people. And I'm glad that you're one of the champions out here doing this work of really making brain health like a central focus. Like we definitely need it. So I appreciate you coming on today. Thanks, doctor. Thanks so much for having me. Great conversation. I really appreciate it.